Chapter 11 The Theatricals On the third day in Christmas week we had the first performance of our theatricals. A great deal of trouble had no doubt been spent on getting them up, but the actors had undertaken it all so that the rest of us had no idea how things were going, what was being done. We did not even know for certain what was to be performed. The actors had done their best during those three days to get hold of costumes when they went out to work. When Baklushin met me, he did nothing but snap his fingers with glee. Even the Major seemed to be in a decent mood, though we really were not sure whether he knew of the theatricals. If he did know, would he give his formal sanction, or only make up his mind to say nothing, winking at the convict's project, insisting, of course, that everything should be as orderly as possible? I imagine he knew about the theatricals and could not but have known of them, but did not want to interfere, realizing that he might make things worse by prohibiting them. The convicts would begin to be disorderly and drunken, so that it would really be much better for them to have something to occupy them. I assume that this was the Major's line of argument, simply because it is most natural, sensible, and correct. It may even be said if the convicts had not got up theatricals or some such entertainment for the holidays, the authorities ought to have thought of it themselves. But as our major's mind did not work like the minds of the rest of mankind, but in quite the opposite way, it may very well be that I am quite in error in supposing that he knew of the theatricals and allowed them. A man like the major must always be oppressing someone, taking something away, depriving men of some right, making trouble somewhere, in fact. He was known all over the town for it. What did it matter to him if restrictions might lead to disturbances in prison? There were penalties for such disturbances, such as the reasoning of men like our major, and severity and strict adherence to the letter of the law is all that the scoundrelly convicts need. These obtuse ministers of the law absolutely fail to understand and are incapable of understanding that the strict adherence to the letter of it, without using their reason, without understanding the spirit of it, leads straight to disturbance and has never led to anything else. It is the law, there's nothing more to be said, they say, and they are genuinely astonished that they should be expected to show common sense in a clear head as well. This seems particularly unnecessary to many of them, a revolting superfluity, a restriction and a piece of intolerance. But however that may have been, the senior sergeant did not oppose the convicts, and that was all they cared about. I can say with certainty that the theatricals and the gratitude felt for their being permitted were the reason why there was not one serious disturbance in the prison during the holidays, not one violent quarrel, not one case of theft. I myself witnessed the convicts themselves trying to repress the riotous or quarrelsome, simply on the ground that the theatricals might be prohibited. The sergeant exacted a promise from the convicts that everything should be orderly and that they would behave themselves. They agreed joyfully and kept their promise faithfully. They were much flattered at their words being trusted. It must be added, however, that it cost the authorities nothing to allow the theatricals. They had not to contribute. No space had to be set apart for the theater. The stage could be rigged up and taken to pieces again in a quarter of an hour. The performance lasted for an hour and a half, and if the order had suddenly come from headquarters to stop the performance, it could all have been put away in a trice. The costumes were hidden in the convicts' boxes. But before I describe how the theatricals were arranged and what the costumes were like, I must describe the program, that is, what it was proposed to perform. There was no written program. But on the second and third performances, a program in the handwriting of Baklushin made its appearance 
For the benefit of the officers and of distinguished visitors generally who had honored our theatricals by being present at the first performance, the officer of the guard usually came, and on one occasion the commanding officer of the guards came himself. The officer of the engineers came, too, on one evening, and it was for visitors like these the program was prepared. It was assumed that the fame of the prison theatricals would spread far and wide in the fortress and would even reach the town, especially as there was no theater in the town. There was a rumor that one performance had been got up by a society of amateurs, but that was all. The convicts were like children, delighted at the smallest success, vain over it indeed. Who knows? they thought and said among themselves. Perhaps even the highest authorities will hear about it. They'll come and have a look. Then they'll see what the convicts are made of. It's not a simple soldier's performance with dummy figures, floating boats, and dancing bears and goats. We have actors, real actors. They act high-class comedies. There's no theater like it even in the town. General Abromazov had a performance, they say, and is going to have another, but I dare say he'll only beat us in the dresses. As for the conversations, who knows whether they'll be as good. It will reach the governor's ears, maybe, and, you never can tell, he may take it into his head to have a look at it himself. There's no theater in the town. In fact, the prisoner's imagination was so worked up during the holidays, especially after the first success, that they were ready to fancy they might receive rewards or have their term of imprisonment shortened, though at the same time they were almost at once ready to laugh very good-naturedly at their own expense. They were children, in fact, perfect children, though some of these children were over forty. But though there was no regular program, I already knew in outline what the performance would consist of. The first piece was called Filatka and Miroshka, or The Rivals. Baklushin had boasted to me a week beforehand that the part of Filatka which he was undertaking would be acted in a style such as had never been seen even in the Petersburg theatres. He strolled about the wards bragging without shame or scruple, though with perfect good nature. And now and then he would suddenly go through a bit of theatrical business, a bit of his part, that is, and they all would laugh, regardless of whether the performance was amusing. Though even then, it must be admitted, the convicts knew how to restrain themselves and keep up their dignity. The only convicts who were enraptured by Baklushin's pranks and his stories of what was coming were either quite young people, greenhorns deficient in reserve, or else the more important among the convicts whose prestige was firmly established, so that they had no reason to be afraid of giving vent to their feelings of any sort, however simple, that is, however unseemly, according to prison notions, they might be. The others listened to the gossip and rumors in silence. They did not, it is true, contradict or disapprove, but they did their utmost to take up an indifferent and even to some extent supercilious attitude to the theatricals. Only during the last days, just before the performance, everyone began to feel inquisitive. What was coming? How would our men do? What was the major saying? Would it be as successful as it was last year? And so on. Baklushin assured me that the actors had been splendidly chosen, everyone to fit his part, that there would even be a curtain, that Filatka's betrothed was to be acted by Sorotkin. And you'll see what he is like in woman's dress, he added, screwing up his eyes and clicking with his tongue. The benevolent lady was to wear a mantle and a dress with a flounce, and to carry a parasol in her hand. The benevolent gentleman was to come on in an officer's coat with epaulets, and was to carry a cane in his hand. There was to be a second piece with a highly dramatic ending called Kedril the Glutton. The title aroused my curiosity, but in spite of all my inquiries I could learn nothing about this piece beforehand. 
I only learnt that they had not taken the play out of a book, but from a written copy, that they got the play from a retired sergeant living in the town, who had probably once taken part in a performance of it himself in some soldier's entertainment. In our remote towns and provinces there are such plays which no one seems to know anything about, and which have perhaps never been printed but seem to have appeared of themselves, and so have become an indispensable part of every people's theatre. It would be a very, very good thing if some investigator would make a fresh and more careful study of the people's drama, which really does exist, and is perhaps by no means valueless. I refuse to believe that all I saw on our prison stage was invented by the convicts themselves. There must be a continuous tradition, established customs and conceptions handed down from generation to generation and consecrated by time. They must be looked for among soldiers, among factory hands, in factory towns, and even among the working classes in some poor, obscure little towns. They are preserved, too, in villages and provincial towns among the servants of the richer country gentry. I imagine, indeed, that many old-fashioned plays have been circulated in written copies all over Russia by house serfs. Many of the old-fashioned landowners and Moscow gentlemen had their own dramatic companies made up of serf actors, and these theatres laid the foundations of the national dramatic art of which there are unmistakable signs. As for Kedril the Glutton, I was able to learn nothing about it beforehand, except that evil spirits appear on the stage and carry Kedril off to hell. But what does the name Kedril mean? Why is it Kedril and not Kirill? Whether it is a Russian story or a foreign origin, I could not find out. It was announced that, finally, there would be a pantomime to the accompaniment of music. All this, of course, was very interesting. The actors were fifteen in number, all smart, spirited fellows. They bestirred themselves, rehearsed, sometimes behind the prison, held their tongues and kept things secret. In fact, they meant to surprise us with something extraordinary and unexpected. On working days the prison was locked up early, as soon as night came on. Christmas week was an exception. They did not lock up till the evening tattoo. This concession was made expressly for the sake of the theatre. Almost every afternoon during Christmas week they sent a messenger from the prison to the officer of the watch with the humble request to allow the theatricals and leave the wards unlocked a little longer, adding that this had been allowed the day before and there had been no disorder. The officer of the watch reasoned that there really had been no disorder the day before, and if they gave their word that there would be none today, it meant that they would see to that themselves, and that made things safer than anything. Besides, if the theatricals were not allowed, maybe, there's no knowing with a lot of criminals, they might get up some mischief through spite and get the watch into trouble. Another point was that it was tedious to serve on the watch, and here was a play not simply got up by the soldiers, but by the convicts, and convicts are an interesting lot. It would be amusing to see it. The officers of the watch always had the privilege of looking on. If his superior officer came along, he would ask, Where is the officer of the watch? He is in the prison, counting over the convicts and locking the wards. A straightforward answer and a sufficient explanation. And so every evening through the Christmas holidays, the officers of the watch allowed the performance, and did not lock the wards till the evening tattoo. The convicts knew beforehand that there would be no hindrance from the officers of the watch, and they had no anxiety on that ground. About seven o'clock Petrov came to fetch me, and we went to the performance together. Almost all the inmates of our ward went to the performance except the old believer and the Poles. 
It was only on the very last performance, on the 4th of January, that the Poles made up their minds to be present, and only then after many assurances that it was nice and amusing, and that there was no risk about it. The disdain of the Poles did not irritate the convicts in the very least, and they were welcomed on the 4th of January quite politely. They were even shown into the best places. As for the Circassians and still more Isaifomich, the performance was to them a real enjoyment. Isaifomich paid three kopecks every time, and on the last performance put ten kopecks in the plate, and there was a look of bliss on his face. The actors decided to collect from the audience what they were willing to give for the expenses of the theater and for their own fortifying. Petrov assured me that I should be put into one of the best seats, however crowded the theater might be, on the ground that being richer than most of them, I should probably subscribe more liberally, and also that I knew more about acting. And so it was. But I will first describe the room and the arrangement of the theater. The military ward in which our stage was arranged was fifteen paces long. From the yard one mounted some steps into the passage leading to the ward. This long ward, as I have mentioned already, was different from the others. The bed platform ran round the wall so that the middle of the room was free. The half of the room nearest to the steps was given up to the spectators, and the other half which communicated with another ward was marked off for the stage. What struck me first of all was the curtain. It stretched for ten feet across the room. To have a curtain was such a luxury that it was certainly something to marvel at. What is more, it was painted in oil colors with a design of trees, arbors, lakes, and stars. It was made of pieces of linen, old and new, such as they were able to collect among the convicts, old leg wrappers and shirts sewn together after a fashion into one large strip. And where the linen fell short, the gap was filled simply with paper which had been begged, sheet by sheet, from various offices and departments. Our painters, amongst whom the Brulov of the prison, A, was conspicuous, had made it their work to decorate and paint it. The effect was surprising. Such a refinement delighted even the most morose and fastidious of the convicts, who, when it came to the performance, were without exception as childish in their admiration as the most enthusiastic and impatient. All were very much pleased and even boastful in their pleasure. The stage was lighted by means of a few tallow candles which were cut into pieces. In front of the curtain stood two benches brought from the kitchen, and in front of the benches were three or four chairs from the sergeant's room. The chairs were intended for any officers that might come in, the benches for the sergeants and the engineering clerks, foremen and other persons in official positions, though not officers, in case any such looked in on the performance. And as a fact, spectators from outside were present at every performance. There were more on some evenings than on others, but at the last performance there was not a vacant seat on the benches. In the back of the room were the convicts themselves, standing, and in spite of the suffocating, steamy heat of the room, wearing their coats or sheepskins, and carrying their caps in their hands, out of respect for their visitors. Of course, the space allotted to the convicts was too small. And not only were people literally sitting on others, especially in the back rows, but the beds too were filled up, as well as the spaces to right and left of the curtain, and there were even some ardent spectators who always went round behind the scenes and looked at the performance from the other ward at the back. The crush in the first part of the ward was incredible and might even be compared to the crush and crowding I had lately seen at the bathhouse. The door into the passage was open 
and the passage where the temperature was twenty degrees below zero was also thronged with people. Petrov and I were at once allowed to go to the front, almost up to the benches, where we could see much better than from the back. They looked upon me as to some extent a theater-goer, a connoisseur, who had frequented performances very different from this. They had seen Baklushin consulting me all this time and treating me with respect, so on this occasion I had the honor of a front place. The convicts were no doubt extremely vain and frivolous, but it was all on the surface. The convicts could laugh at me, seeing that I was a poor hand at their work. Almatsov could look with contempt upon us gentlemen and pride himself on knowing how to burn alabaster. But mixed with their persecution and ridicule there was another element. We had once been gentlemen. We belonged to the same class as their former masters, of whom they could have no pleasant memories. But now at the theatricals they made way for me. They recognized that in this I was a better critic, that I had seen and knew more than they. Even those who liked me least were, I know for a fact, anxious now for my approval of their theatricals, and without the slightest servility they let me have the best place. I see that now, recalling my impressions at the time. It seemed to me at the time, I remember, that in their correct estimate of themselves there was no servility but a sense of their own dignity. The highest and most striking characteristic of our people is just their sense of justice and their eagerness for it. There is no trace in the common people of the desire to be cock of the walk on all occasions and at all costs, whether they deserve to be or not. One has but to take off the outer, superimposed husk, and to look at the colonel more closely, more attentively, and without prejudice, and some of us will see things in the people that we should never have expected. There is not much our wise men could teach them. On the contrary, I think it is the wise men who ought to learn from the people. Before we started, Petrov told me naively that I should have a front place partly because I should subscribe more. There was no fixed price of admission. Everyone gave what he could or what he wished. When the plate was taken round, almost everyone put something in it, even if it were only a halfpenny. But if I were given a front place partly on account of money, on the supposition that I should give more than others, what a sense of their own dignity there was in that again! You are richer than I am, so you can stand in front, and though we are all equal, you'll give more, and so a spectator like you is more pleasing to the actors. You must have the first place, for we are all here not thinking of the money, but showing our respect, so we ought to sort ourselves of our own accord. How much fine and genuine pride there is in this! It is a respect not for money, but respect for oneself. As a rule, there was not much respect for money, for wealth in the prison, especially if one looks at convicts without distinction, as a gang in the mass. I can't remember one of them seriously demeaning himself for the sake of money. There were men who were always begging, who begged even of me. But this was rather mischief, roguery, than the real thing. There was too much humor and naivety in it. I don't know whether I express myself so as to be understood. But I am forgetting the theatricals. To return. Till the curtain was raised, the whole room was a strange and animated picture. To begin with, masses of spectators crowded, squeezed tightly, packed on all sides, waiting with patient and blissful faces for the performance to begin. In the back rows, men were clambering on one another. Many of them had brought blocks of wood from the kitchen. Fixing the thick block of wood against the wall, a man would climb onto it, leaning with both hands on the shoulders of someone in front of him, and would stand like that without changing his attitude for the whole two hours, perfectly satisfied with himself and his position. 
Others got their feet on the lower step of the stove and stayed so all the time, leading on men in front of them. This was quite in the hindmost rows next to the wall. At the sides, too, men were standing on the bed in dense masses above the musicians. This was a good place. Five people had clambered onto the stove itself and, lying on it, looked down from it. They must have been blissful. The window sills on the opposite wall were also crowded with people who had come in late or failed to get a good place. Everyone behaved quietly and decorously. Everyone wished to show himself in the best light before the gentry and the officers. All faces expressed a simple-hearted expectation. Every face was red and bathed in sweat from the closeness and heat. A strange light of childlike joy, of pure sweet pleasure, was shining on these lined and branded brows and cheeks, on those faces usually so morose and gloomy, in those eyes which sometimes gleamed with such terrible fire. They were all bareheaded, and all the heads were shaven on the right side. Suddenly sounds of bustle and hurrying were heard on the stage. In a minute the curtain would rise. Then the band struck up. This band deserves special mention. Eight musicians were installed on the bed on one side. Two violins, one from the prison and one borrowed from someone in the fortress, but both the fiddlers were convicts. Three balalaikas, all homemade. Two guitars and a tambourine instead of a double bass. The violins simply scraped and squealed. The guitars were wretched, but the balalaikas were wonderful. The speed with which they twanged the strings with their fingers was a positive feat of agility. They played dance tunes. At the liveliest part of the tunes, the balalaika players would tap the case of the instruments with their knuckles. The tone, the taste, the execution, the handling of the instrument and the characteristic rendering of the tune, all was individual, original, and typical of the convicts. One of the guitarists, too, played his instrument splendidly. This was the gentleman who had murdered his father. As for the tambourine, it was simply marvelous. The player whirled it round on his finger and drew his thumb across the surface. Now we heard rapid, resonant, monotonous taps. Then suddenly this loud, distinct sound seemed to be broken into a shower of innumerable jangling and whispering notes. Two accordions also appeared on the scene. Upon my word, I had had no idea till then what could be done with simple peasant instruments. The blending and harmony of sounds, above all, the spirit, the character of the conception and rendering of the tune in its very essence, were simply amazing. For the first time I realized fully all the reckless dash and gaiety of the gay, dashing Russian dance songs. At last the curtain rose. There was a general stir. Everyone shifted from one leg to the other. Those at the back stood on tiptoe. Someone fell off his block of wood. Everyone, without exception, opened his mouth and stared, and absolute silence reigned. The performance began. Near me was standing Ale in a group consisting of his brothers and all the other Circassians. They were all intensely delighted with the performance and came every evening afterwards. All Mohammedans, Tatars, and others, as I have noticed more than once, are passionately fond of spectacles of all sorts. Next to them, Isaifomich had tucked himself in. From the moment the curtain rose, he seemed to be all ears and eyes and simple-hearted, greedy expectations of delights and marvels. It would have been pitiful indeed if he had been disappointed. Ale's charming face beamed with such pure childlike joy that I must confess I felt very happy in looking at him, and I remember that at every amusing and clever sally on the part of the actors, 
when there was a general burst of laughter, I could not help turning to Ale and glancing at his face. He did not see me. He had no attention to spare for me. On the left side, quite near me, stood an old convict who was always scowling, discontented and grumbling. He, too, noticed Ale, and I saw him more than once turn with a half-smile towards him. He was so charming. Ale Semyonich, he called him. I don't know why. They began with Filatka and Miroshka. Filatka, acted by Baklushin, was really splendid. He played his part with amazing precision. One could see that he had thought out every phrase, every movement. Into the slightest word or gesture, he knew how to put value and significance in perfect harmony with the character he was acting. And to this conscientious effort and study must be added an inimitable gaiety, simplicity, and naturalness. If you had seen Baklushin, you would certainly have agreed that he was a born actor of real talent. I had seen Falatka more than once at theatres in Moscow and Petersburg, and I can say positively that the city actors were inferior to Baklushin in the part of Falatka. By comparison with him, they were too much of paysan. They were not real Russian peasants. They were too anxious to mimic the Russian peasant. Baklushin was stirred, too, by emulation. Everyone knew that in the second play the part of Kedril would be taken by the convict Potsekin, who was for some reason considered by all a more talented actor than Baklushin, and at this Baklushin was as chagrined as a child. How often he had come to me during those last few days to give vent to his feelings! Two hours before the performance he was in a perfect fever. When they laughed and shouted to him from the crowd, Bravo, Baklushin! First rate! His whole face beamed with pleasure. There was a light of real inspiration in his eyes. The scene of his kissing Miroshka, when Falatka shouts to him beforehand, Wipe your nose! and wipes his own, was killingly funny. Everyone was rocking with laughter. But what interested me more than all was the audience. They were all completely carried away. They gave themselves up to their pleasure without reserve. Shouts of approbation sounded more and more frequently. One would nudge his neighbor and hurriedly whisper his impressions, without caring or even noticing who was beside him. Another would turn ecstatically to the audience at an amusing passage, hurriedly look at everyone, wave his hand as though calling on everyone to laugh, and immediately turn greedily round to the stage again. Another one simply clicked with his fingers and his tongue, and could not stand still, but being unable to move from his place, kept shifting from one leg to the other. By the end of the performance, the general gaiety had reached its height. I am not exaggerating anything. Imagine prison, fetters, bondage, the vista of melancholy years ahead, the life of days as monotonous as the drip of water on a dull autumn day. And suddenly all these oppressed and outcast are allowed for one short hour to relax, to rejoice, to forget the weary dream, to create a complete theater, and to create it to the pride and astonishment of the whole town, to show what fellows we convicts are. Of course, everything interested them. The dresses, for example. They were awfully curious, for instance, to see a fellow like Vanka Otpeti or Netsvateyev or Baklushin in a different dress from that in which they had seen them every day for so many years. Why, he is a convict, a convict the same as ever, with the fetters jingling on him. And there he is in a frock coat, with a round hat on, in a cloak, like an ordinary person. He's got on mustaches and a wig. Here he's brought a red handkerchief out of his pocket. He is fanning himself with it. He is acting a gentleman, for all the world as though he were a gentleman. 
and all were in raptures. The benevolent country gentleman came on in an adjutant's uniform, a very old one, it's true, in epaulets and a cap with a cockade, and made an extraordinary sensation. There were two competitors for the part, and, would you believe it, they quarreled like little children as to which should play it. Both were eager to appear in an adjutant's uniform with shoulder knots. The other actors parted them, and by a majority of votes gave the part to Netsvateyev, not because he was better looking and more presentable than the other, and so looked more like a gentleman, but because Netsvateyev assured them that he would come on with a cane and would wave it about and draw patters on the ground with it like a real gentleman and tip-top swell, which Vanka Otpeti could not do, for he had never seen any real gentleman. And indeed, when Netsvateyev came on the stage with his lady, he kept on rapidly drawing patterns on the floor with a thin reedy cane, which he had picked up somewhere, no doubt considering this a sign of the highest breeding, foppishness, and fashion. Probably at some time in his childhood, as a barefoot servant boy, he had happened to see a finely dressed gentleman with a cane, and been fascinated by his dexterity with it and the impression had remained printed indelibly on his memory, so that now at thirty he remembered it exactly as it was, for the enchantment and delectation of the whole prison. Netsvateyev was so absorbed in his occupation that he looked at no one. He even spoke without raising his eyes. He simply watched the tip of his cane. The benevolent country lady, too, was a remarkable conception in its way. She came on in a shabby old muslin dress which looked no better than a rag, with her neck and arms bare, and her face horribly rouged and powdered, with a cotton nightcap tied under her chin, carrying a parasol in one hand, and in the other a painted paper fan with which she continually fanned herself. A roar of laughter greeted this lady's appearance. The lady herself could not refrain from laughing several times, a convict called Ivanov took the part. Sirotkin, dressed up as a girl, looked very charming. The verses, too, went off very well. In fact, the play gave complete satisfaction to all. There was no criticism, and indeed there could not be. The orchestra played the song My Porch, My New Porch, by way of overture, and the curtain rose again. The second piece was Kedril, a play somewhat in the style of Don Juan. At least the master and servant are both carried off to hell by devils at the end. They acted all they had, but it was obviously a fragment of which the beginning and the end were lost. There was no meaning or consistency in it. The action takes place in Russia, at an inn. The innkeeper brings a gentleman in an overcoat and a battered round hat into the room. He is followed by his servant Kedril carrying a trunk and a fowl wrapped up in a piece of blue paper. Kedril wears a sheepskin and a footman's cap. It is he who is the glutton. He was acted by Baklushin's rival, Putsekin. His master was acted by Ivanov, who had been the benevolent lady in the first piece. The innkeeper, Netsvateyev, warns them that the room is haunted by devils and then goes away. The gentleman, gloomy and preoccupied, mutters that he knew that long ago, and tells Kedril to unpack his things and prepare the supper. Kedril is a coward and a glutton. Hearing about the devils, he turns pale and trembles like a leaf. He would run away, but is afraid of his master. And, what's more, he is hungry. He is greedy, stupid, cunning in his own way, and cowardly. He deceives his master at every step, and at the same time is afraid of him. He is a striking type which obscurely and remotely suggests the character of Leporello. It was really remarkably rendered. Potsekin had unmistakable talent, and in my opinion was even a better actor than Baklushin. 
Of course, when I met Baclutian next day, I did not express my opinion quite frankly. I should have wounded him too much. The convict who acted the master acted pretty well, too. He talked the most fearful nonsense, but his delivery was good and spirited, and his gestures were appropriate. While Kedril was busy with the trunk, the master paced up and down the stage lost in thought and announced aloud that that evening he had reached the end of his travels. Kedril listened inquisitively, made grimaces, spoke aside, and made the audience laugh at every word. He had no pity for his master, but he had heard of the devils. He wants to know what that meant, and so he begins to talk and ask questions. His master at last informs him that in some difficulty in the past he had invoked the aid of hell. The devils had helped him and had extricated him, but that today the hour had come, and that perhaps that evening the devils would arrive according to their compact to carry off his soul. Kedril begins to be panic-stricken. But the gentleman keeps up his spirits and tells him to prepare the supper. Kedril brightens up, brings out the fowl, brings out some wine, and now and then pulls a bit off the fowl and tastes it. The audience laughs. Then the door creaks. The wind rattles the shutters. Kedril shudders in hastily, almost unconsciously, stuffs into his mouth a piece of chicken too huge for him to swallow. Laughter again. Is it ready? asks the gentleman, striding about the room. Directly, sir, I am getting it ready, says Kedril. He seats himself at the table and calmly proceeds to make away with his master's supper. The audience is evidently delighted at the smartness and cunning of the servant and at the master's being made a fool of. It must be admitted that Potsakin really deserved the applause he got. The words, Directly, sir, I am getting it ready, he pronounced superbly. Sitting at the table, he began eating greedily, starting at every step his master took, for fear the latter should notice what he was about. As soon as the master turned round, he hid under the table, pulling the chicken after him. At last he had taken off the edge of his appetite. The time came to think of his master. Kedro, how long will you be?' cries the master. "'Ready,' Kedro replies briskly, suddenly realizing that there is hardly anything left for his master. There is nothing but one drumstick left on the plate.' The gentleman, gloomy and preoccupied, sits down to the table, noticing nothing, and Kedril stands behind his chair, holding a napkin. Every word, every gesture, every grimace of Kedril's, when, turning to the audience, he winked at his simpleton of a master, was greeted by the spectators with irresistible peals of laughter. But as the master begins to eat, the devils appear. At this point the play became quite incomprehensible, and the devil's entrance was really too grotesque. A door opened in the wing, and something in white appeared having a lantern with a candle in it instead of a head. Another phantom, also with a lantern on his head, held a scythe. Why the lanterns? Why the scythe? Why the devils in white? No one could make out. Though, indeed, no one thought of it. It was evidently as it should be. The gentleman turns pretty pluckily to the devils and shouts to them that he is ready for them to take him. But Kedril is as frightened as a hare. He creeps under the table, but for all his fright does not forget to take the bottle with him. The devils vanish for a minute. Kedril creeps out from under the table. But as soon as the master attacks the chicken once more, three devils burst into the room again, seize the master from behind, and carry him off to the lower regions. Kedril, save me! shouts his master. But Kedril has no attention to spare. This time he has carried off the bottle, a plate, and even the loaf under the table. Here he is now alone. 
There are no devils, no master either. Kedril creeps out, looks about him, and his face lights up with a smile. He winks slyly, sits down in his master's place, and nodding to the audience, says in a half-whisper, Well, now I am alone, without a master. Everyone roars at his being without a master, and then he adds in a half-whisper, turning confidentially to the audience and winking more and more merrily, THE DEVILS HAVE GOT MY MASTER! The rapture of the audience was beyond all bounds. Apart from the master's being taken by the devils, this was said in such a way, with such slyness, such an ironically triumphant grimace, that it was impossible not to applaud. But Kedril's luck did not last long. He had hardly taken the bottle, filled his glass, and raised it to his lips, when the devils suddenly come back, steal up on tiptoe behind him, and seize him under the arms. Kedril screams at the top of his voice. He is so frightened he dare not look round. He cannot defend himself either. He has the bottle in one hand and the glass in the other, and cannot bring himself to part with either. For half a minute he sits, his mouth wide open with fright, staring at the audience with such a killing expression of cowardly terror that he might have sat for a picture. At last he is lifted up and carried away. Still holding the bottle, he kicks and screams and screams. His screams are still heard from behind the scenes. But the curtain drops and everyone laughs. Everyone is delighted. The orchestra strikes up the Kamarinsky. They begin quietly, hardly audibly, but the melody grows stronger and stronger, the time more rapid. Now and then comes the jaunty note of a flip on the case of the instrument. It is the Kamarinsky in all its glory, and indeed it would have been nice if Glinka could by chance have heard it in the prison. The pantomime begins to the music, which is kept up all through. The scene is the interior of a cottage. On the stage are a miller and his wife. The miller in one corner is mending some harness. In the other corner his wife is spinning flax. The wife was played by Sorotkin, the miller by Netsvetaev. I may observe that our scenery was very poor. Both in this play and in the others we rather supplied the scene from our imagination than saw it in reality. By way of a background there was a rug or a horse cloth of some sort, on one side a wretched sort of screen. On the left side there was nothing at all so that we could see the bed, but the audience was not critical and was ready to supply all deficiencies by their imagination, and indeed convicts are very good at doing so. If you are told it's a garden, you've got to look on it as a garden. If it's a room, it's a room. If it's a cottage, it's a cottage. It doesn't matter, and there is no need to make a fuss about it. Sorotkin was very charming in the dress of a young woman. Several compliments were paid him in undertones among the audience. The miller finishes his work, takes up his hat, takes up his whip, goes up to his wife and explains to her by signs that he must go out, but that if his wife admits anyone in his absence, then... And he indicates the whip. The wife listens and nods. Probably she is well acquainted with that whip. The hussy amuses herself when her husband is away. The husband goes off. As soon as he has gone, the wife shakes her fist after him. Then there is a knock. The door opens and another miller appears, a neighbor, a peasant with a beard, wearing a full coat. He has a present for her, a red kerchief. The woman laughs, but as soon as the neighbor tries to embrace her, there is another knock. Where can he hide? She hurriedly hides him under the table and sits down to her distaff again. Another admirer makes his appearance an army clerk in military dress. So far the pantomime had gone admirably, 
the gestures were perfectly appropriate. One could not help wondering as one looked at these impromptu actors. One could not help thinking how much power and talent in Russia are sometimes wasted in servitude and poverty. But the convict who acted the clerk had probably at some time been on some private or provincial stage, and he imagined that our performers, one and all, had no notion of acting and did not move on the stage as they ought to. And he paced the stage as we are told the classic heroes used to in the past. He would take one long stride, and before moving the other leg, stop short, throw his head and whole body back, look haughtily around him, and take another stride. If such deportment is absurd in the classical drama, in an army clerk in a comic scene it is even more ridiculous. But our audience thought that probably it was as it ought to be, and took for granted the long strides of the lanky clerk without criticizing them. The clerk had hardly reached the middle of the stage before another knock was heard. The woman was in a flutter again. Where was she to put the clerk? Into a chest which stood conveniently open. The clerk creeps into the chest and she shuts the lid on him. This time it is a different sort of visitor, a lover too, but of a special kind. It is a Brahmin, and even dressed as one. There is an overwhelming burst of laughter from the audience. The Brahmin was acted by the convict Kushkin, and acted beautifully. He looked like a Brahmin. In pantomime he suggests the intensity of his feelings. He raises his hands to heaven, then lays them on his heart. But he has hardly begun to be sentimental when there is a loud knock at the door. From the sound one can tell it is the master of the house. The frightened wife is beside herself. The Brahmin rushes about like one possessed and implores her to conceal him. She hurriedly puts him behind the cupboard and, forgetting to open the door, rushes back to her work and goes on spinning, heedless of her husband's knocking. In her alarm she twiddles in her fingers an imaginary thread and turns an imaginary distaff, while the real one lies on the floor. Sorotkin acted her terror very cleverly and successfully. But the husband breaks open the door with his foot, and whip in hand approaches his wife. He has been on the watch and has seen it all, and he plainly shows her on his fingers that she has three men hidden, and then he looks for the stowaways. The one he finds first is the neighbor, and cuffing him he leads him out of the room. The terrified clerk, wanting to escape, puts his head out from under the lid and so betrays himself. The husband thrashes him with the whip, and this time the amorous clerk skips about in anything but a classic style. The Brahmin is left. The husband is a long while looking for him. He finds him in the corner behind the cupboard, bows to him politely, and drags him by the beard into the middle of the stage. The Brahmin tries to defend himself, shouts, Accursed man! Accursed man! The only words uttered in the pantomime, but the husband takes no notice and deals with him after his own fashion. The wife, seeing that her turn is coming next, flings down the flax and the distaff and runs out of the room. The spinning bench tips over on the floor. The convicts laugh. Ale tugs at my arm without looking at me and shouts to me, Look! The Brahmin! The Brahmin! Laughing so that he can hardly stand. The curtain falls. A second scene follows. But there is no need to describe them all. There were two or three more. They were all amusing and inimitably comic. If the convicts did not positively invent them, each of them put something of his own into them. Almost every one of the actors improvised something so that the following evenings the same parts acted by the same actors were somewhat different. The last pantomime of a fantastic character concluded with a ballet. It was a funeral. 
The Brahmin, with numerous attendants, repeated various spells over the coffin, but nothing was of use. At last the strains of the setting sun are heard. The corpse comes to life, and all begin to dance with joy. The Brahmin dances with the resuscitated corpse and dances in a peculiar Brahminical fashion. And so the theatricals were over till the next evening. The convicts dispersed merry and satisfied. They praised the actors. They thanked the sergeant. There were no sounds of quarreling. Everyone was unusually contented, even as it were happy, and fell asleep not as on other nights, but almost with a tranquil spirit. And why, one wonders? And yet it is not a fancy of my imagination. It's the truth, the reality. These poor people were only allowed to do as they liked ever so little, to be merry like human beings, to spend one short hour not as though in prison, and they were morally transformed, if only for a few minutes. Now it is the middle of the night. I start and wake up. The old man is still praying on the stove and will pray there till dawn. Ale is sleeping quietly beside me. I remember that he was still laughing and talking to his brothers about the theatricals as he fell asleep, and unconsciously I look closer into his peaceful, childlike face. Little by little I recall everything. The previous day, the holidays, the whole of that month. I lift up my head in terror and look round at my sleeping companions by the dim, flickering light of the prison candle. I look at their poor faces, at their poor beds, at the hopeless poverty and destitution. I gaze at it, as though I wanted to convince myself that it is really true and not the continuation of a hideous dream. But it is true. I hear a moan. Someone drops his arm heavily, and there is a clank of chains. Another starts in his sleep and begins to speak, while the old man on the stove prays for all good Christians, and I hear the even cadence of his soft, prolonged, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us. After all, I am not here forever, only for a few years, I think and I lay my head on the pillow again. Breaking In This chapter's portrayal of the prison theatricals is another of the famous scenes of the book. The convicts are not wrong in assuming Dostoevsky to be an enthusiast for the theater, and the author is certainly not feigning his intense interest in the Russian folk drama that he is discovering here for the first time. It's that second play, Kedril, which is most noteworthy here, since it appears to be original with the Russian folk. When our narrator says that the character of Kedril is roughly like Leporello, he is referring to a character from Mozart's opera Don Giovanni. Don Giovanni is modeled after Don Juan, and Leporello is his servant. The play Kedril appears to preserve some of the Don Juan legend, with gluttony replacing libertinism as the core vice. The Kamarinsky is a famous Russian folk song. Mikhail Glinka composed an orchestral version of it in 1848, just a few years before Dostoevsky would have witnessed this performance. This particular episode appears to have made a significant impression on the author, as the Komarinsky would play a significant role in his 1859 Siberian novella, The Village of Stepanchikovo. This chapter also marks the end of Part 1 of the book, Typically, at a major stopping point like this one, I would want to pause and to take stock of the major plot lines we have encountered. As this work has no plot to speak of, here I would like to try something else. A roster of the convicts we have encountered so far, matching each one to his purported crime. 
This will give us a reminder of who exactly is populating this prison, and that, after all, is the primary substance of the book. Now, for many of the convicts, we simply don't know what their crimes are. We are given no indication, for instance, what brought Almatsov, the surly alabaster pounder, or the jocular Varlamov, to the prison, nor do we know the crime of the buffoon Skuratov, unless, that is, you can make more sense out of his clowning comments in Chapter 6 than I can. But we do know at least something about the crimes of several of them. Some of the crimes seem minor. Osip, the colossal but meek cook, is in for smuggling, and, as we have seen, is simply addicted to the craft. The exceptionally servile Sushilov was originally arrested for something minor, although we don't know what. But he is in for life, because he meekly traded sentences with another convict for a ruble and a red shirt while on the road to Siberia. There are other figures who seem far too virtuous properly to belong in the prison camp, and are there more because of their deep loyalty to higher causes. Our elderly old believer, for instance, is an extraordinarily pious man, but his piety led him to burn down an orthodox church in defense of his faith. Similarly, we have figures who have been swept up in larger political movements. Dostoevsky and his unnamed companion, of course, are among their number, as are the Poles, such as M or B., but we also meet convicts from both sides of the war in the Caucasus. Akima Kimich is a fastidious, chaste man, and yet his lack of sense led him to shoot a traitorous chief without a trial before his whole command, and he still is unable to see the error of his action. On the flip side, we see Circassians who are just like the chief that Akima Kimich murdered. Nura, for instance, made raids against the Russians despite being a member of an allied tribe. The kind and gentle Ale, too, was unwittingly swept up in a raid on an Armenian merchant, and simply due to his loyalty to his elder brothers. In each of these cases we are dealing with good people, whose fealty to a cause, combined with either bad luck or a lack of sense, leads straight to Siberia. Similarly, military duty seems frequently to lead to prison. Akim Akimich, of course, was an officer, and in his case imprisonment is due to a lack of judgment. But several prisoners are there simply because of how miserable the life of a soldier was. The wretched fiddler who follows around the drunken revelers who are on a spree is imprisoned for the crime of desertion. Both Sorotkin and Petrov murdered their commanding officers. Sorotkin simply couldn't endure the life of a soldier and would do anything to get out of it. Petrov could handle the hardships of military life, but took exception to the bullying of his commanding colonel, and so killed him, and very nearly killed Major Eight Eyes of the prison camp as well. Luchka's case is a bit different, but he, too, was driven to kill by the authoritarian excesses of the warden of his prison. Baklushin also was a soldier at the time of his crime, although his crime has nothing to do with military duty. He killed an insufferable snob over a woman. In fact, when we look at the roster of murderers in the prison camp, we can understand why it is that Dostoevsky insists, towards the end of chapter 3, that murder comes in many different flavors. We can understand the murders by a Sorotkin or a Baklushin. And Dostoevsky has given us the tools to understand the murders by Akim Akimich and Petrov and Luchka. It is hard to believe that the silly old man Isai Fomich should be a murderer, and yet that was his crime— and we have seen how easily decent people could be led to violence. But on the opposite end of the spectrum, we have our gentleman parricide, whose psychological makeup Dostoevsky finds unfathomable. And then we have the vodka smuggler Gazin, 
who was reputed to have murdered children for the thrill of it, and the terrible bandit Orlov, who could kill multiple times without the slightest pang of conscience. Curiously, however, despite his encounters with monsters like Gazin and Orlov, Dostoevsky's greatest repugnance isn't for these, but for a non-violent criminal, the gentleman known only as A. A's crime was to sell false information to the police authorities, accusing innocent people of crimes they did not commit. Dostoevsky could have a lengthy conversation with the bandit Orlov, but he could not endure the presence of the loathsome A. The fact that he should find A to be the most execrable convict of the prison camp is of interest, and I may return to this fact in the closing comments of this project. We are now halfway through the book. So far, we have walked through the narrator Goryantikov's first month or two of prison life. Part two is organized topically, beginning with a few chapters covering his experience in the prison hospital. We will turn there next. End of comments.